My name is uh, Patrick Burgle. I'm an honorary research associate in the department, and I'm here to talk to you about CHIRP. Um, so, this uh, is Erythacus rubecula, as I'm sure you know, otherwise known as the common robin. And one day, as I lay in my bed, I reasoned to myself as a creative technology person should, surely inside this is data. Surely there's information in, in his or her beautiful mellifluous sound, just as I'm broadcasting some information to you using the medium of my voice, so he or she is broadcasting a small but measurable amount of useful bits to other birds and to other species. And uh, I'll leave it to you to decide how many of these bits are in fact useful or interesting. So, with this uh, sort of slightly outre idea in mind, we created an application that we call Chirp. And now I feel a product demonstration coming on. I'd like to invite the lovely Daniel to be my assistant. So, Chirp is an application currently for smartphones, and what it does is this. Let's say we've got two users. Let's call them Alice and Bob. Alice wants to share some information with Bob. What she does is fire up our app thus. Voila! By the miracle of sound, we've shared a little bit of data. Let's do it one more time so you can see it's not a magic trick. OK, fantastic. So what we've done there is created um, a 50-bit link, a very short identifier, just like a web link, but what is it? this is made of sound. You can think of this as a sonic barcode. And that passes over the air, is decoded locally on the device, understood by the device, that little sequence of notes, and then an image is pulled down from the cloud. Um, 50 bits doesn't sound like a lot of information. Chirp is probably the world's slowest internet protocol, or at least the slowest one invented uh, in the last 30, 40 years. Um, but that's not the point. The point is that sound is everywhere. These are the speakers from a Nokia 6110, a very fine uh, phone from the 1990s. And there's millions of these horrid plastic speakers on planet Earth. There are probably many more loudspeakers on Earth than there are people by some considerable margin. And so if we can use loudspeakers, to move information, we think we've created a rather powerful, interesting technology that can be applied in lots of places everywhere. So what we're interested in doing is taking this idea and applying it to lots of different use cases in lots of different places. Now, we launched the application, we were a little bit surprised. We had a hit. Who knew? People have responded very positively to what we've done. Uh, we've got great reviews. The application has become uh, a number one application in uh, six countries, uh, from Alaska to Madagascar. Everyone's chirping. Uh, we were the number one application in the UK, Germany, France, Canada, China, and a top 20 app in 56, count them, 56 countries worldwide. And we were a little bit surprised. We were somewhat taken aback, I must say, but that's always nice. Um, so just a little bit on how the, uh, how the system works. Um, those notes, these first two notes, are what we call the front door, and they wake up the system and then says, here comes some data. Uh, the next uh, eight notes are the payload, the information that it's looking for, and the last are a form of error correction, and we use the same kind of error correction that you might have found on a CD, if anyone remembers CDs, such that uh, <laughs> if, if around about 30% of the signal is completely erased because it's noisy, because it's too loud, then the signal can still be decoded and we can still transfer a little bit of information. Um, uh, this is my gloating slide. I think I've prematurely gloated, but here it is again. Drink it in. Um, so the problem that we've solved, uh, solved because we're interested in real-world problems, is, is pretty simple. These devices are fun to develop on, but they're no fun to use. Does anyone like typing on mobile keyboards? No, I, I thought not. Does anyone like Bluetooth? Again, I thought not. Um, and so it's an obvious pain point. People want to share data. All the new technologies coming down the pike, like Bluetooth LE and NFC, don't quite do what they're really meant to. They're sold to us as uh, easy and fantastic panaceas, but they mean you have to buy a new phone. But what about all the people with old phones? What about all the radios, the televisions, the PA systems, the ATMs, the point of sale terminals that could be sharing data with you right now? So we built a little bridge between people and between devices. Um, from a business perspective, how we, how we monetize this, so we, we've created a startup that was uh, beautifully incubated by UCL Business. Uh, they gave us some money to do patents and prototypes. Um, from, a, from a financial point of view, we let users of media, owners of media, for example, uh, people who've got uh, music that they want to share, video, advertising, coupons, things of that nature, we let people know where Alice and Bob were when the transaction took place. And because it's such an easy way to share things, every time an Alice or a Bob adds something to the system, we tend to have about uh, uh, you know, at least one Charles. So that compares very favorably with other sharing mechanisms you might know, like Twitter or Facebook. Um, so 
It's important to understand that anything that's a link, anything with a unique address can in fact be chirped. We don't care what it is. Um, if you want to share some data, you can add it to the system. We turn that into audio and then that can be distributed widely. Um, <coughs> to repeat, there's a lot of these on planet Earth, which is why we think this is an interesting business. So one uh, happy consequence of my work on Chirp is I get to spend some pleasurable time looking at real and actual birds and the way that they make sound and to understand the different regimes that birds identify themselves very quickly with another bird. Perhaps, they, uh, perhaps they're interested in being very friendly with another bird. Perhaps they are interested in uh, avoiding predators or locating food. And there are indeed uh, uh, natural protocols. There are uh, organic ways of sharing data. We can learn from that. Um, just as birds um, have, uh, well, I'll just I'll, I'll, I said to Tony, I wouldn't say too much about birdsong, but just one, one thing that I particularly like. Birds actually have two voice boxes. I have a larynx. I'm just, I'm a monophonic thing. I can only make one sound at a time. But birds are able to breathe and sing at the same time. They have a syrinx. They have a voice box effectively above each lung. Um, and that means that birdsong is a lot quicker. And the speed of the notes is very important to us because it means that our little chirping sound can be a lot faster than sounds that you might find generated um, by machines, by music and by human speech. So that enables us to cut through the noise of the real world. Um, uh, and here we can see two birds acting as one. OK, so this is a fun idea. So now we think, well, perhaps different devices could have different uh, speech characteristics. Perhaps we could model larynxes for individual devices. Perhaps Alice's, Alice's phone could sound different to Bob's phone. And that's how Alice's phone identifies itself. So once we start with this idea of biomimicry, what can we learn from nature, a whole raft of possibilities opens up to us. Um, at the moment, the application is mainly used for fun stuff, for sharing pictures. But what we hope in future is that we use for more commercial applications like sharing tickets and gigs. Uh, it's quite, uh, again, unexpected, but we're seeing chirp being used in schools. Teachers are chirping class notes to their kids, which is fantastic. We had no idea that the system would be used in such a way, but it is. Um, and of course, the web can be chirped as well. Um, we can put uh, chirps into any standard uh, URL, or you can make ch stuff jump from one uh, thing like a laptop to a phone. Uh, typically, if I'm trying to uh, send, get to a location, I, I might dial up a map on the big web, then I have to open up an email client, mail it to myself, open it up on the other end. But it'd be much simpler if I could just chirp that map reference to my phone. Um, our first commercial product project was with Topshop. Um, and here we are at London Fashion Week. These are my shoes. I'm in fashion, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and uh, underneath this, you can see chirpable elements backstage. Get backstage to meet the lovely ladies of Topshop and get views you couldn't otherwise, uh, otherwise receive. In the garden at Regent's Park for this event, we had uh, chirping speakers in the trees. They were chirping shoes and makeup from the trees. And thus, another dream long held uh, comes true. Uh, and uh, here you can see some of the content that we generated. Here you can see some happy customers receiving chirps as if by magic from a tree built in the store in Oxford Circus, and so on and so forth. And so where we're moving is to put chirp on very simple devices. Chirp on chip. This is chirp on an Arduino. We should do this on Engduino, obviously. Uh, we call this chirpino. Um, and uh, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I think the future is in all these uh, uh, simple, dumb devices that we're going to start seeing a lot more of. So finally, the thing that gets us very excited is to see Chirp applied in lots of contexts that we'd hardly even dreamed of. This is what we want to do, is, is create a sonic language for the Internet of Things. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.